So now that we covered our discussion on the effector cells known as cytotoxic T cells, which are all about cell-mediated immunity, we're going to now look at the humoral side of adaptive immunity, and that is all about the B cells and their respective antibodies. So we'll entitle the next flowchart B cells and antibodies, because they're both going to work simultaneously in order to ensure a quick, efficient, and prolonged and successful humoral response. So, in order for this to happen, it doesn't just occur all the time, you of course have to have activation. The immune system is full of activation. So let's take a look at how B cells, which secrete antibodies, are activated. So we need to have B cell activation in order for a humoral response to occur. B cell activation is summarized in figure 43.18. So let's discuss. What we need to have, of course, is this idea of that middleman, which was, of course, the helper T cells. Because initially, um, you have to have an inactive B cell floating around, right? But remember how I said that antigen presenting cells or phagocytic cells, whatever they may be, there are many different forms, like dendritic cells or macrophages. B cells themselves can also be antigen presenting cells. Therefore, what we notice is that in B-cell activation, a lot of the times an inactive B-cell will be floating around, and it may engulf an antigen, right? That's very much possible as an antigen-presenting cell. So if it engulfs an antigen, its next job is to, of course, display that antigen because it's an APC. So we'll state that. The B-cell is an inactive state still. It displays the antigen fragments because it breaks them down utilizing those cellular enzymes, displays antigen fragments on a specific molecule. The specific molecule that we want to put an antigen on, if we want to activate the B cells, are going to be MHC2. Now, don't get me wrong. And B cells have the MHC1 capability, but right now I did not state that the B cell was infected. It was not uh, completely in, uh, full of pathogen. It was just engulfed a piece of an antigen, right? A piece of a pathogen. And therefore, it makes no sense to kill the B cell right now with a cytotoxic T cell because all it did was engulf a small piece of the pathogen known as an antigen. So now, what it does is it displays that small piece on MHC2. If it displayed it on MHC1, that would be bad because that may be a signal for cytotoxic T cell to come in and kill the B cell. But we don't want that. We just want the B cell to be activated. That's why we put it on MHC2, because antigen presentation via a B cell must occur on MHC2. And which cell, which actual part of immunity is going to recognize MHC2? Now, let's just remember that this is APC. This is the APC function, displaying an antigen fragment on MHC2. But who's going to come in and say, oh, I see something on MHC2. I should figure out what to do with that. That's, of course, going to be the helper T cells. T sub H is going to be attracted to this display of MHC class 2 plus the antigen within MHC class 2. So when you have this combination shown on the surface of the B cell, the helper T cell comes by and is attracted to it. You'll have that same exact recognition sequence of the helper T cell receptor and the CD4 receptor binding to MHC2 and the antigen that's associated with it. This all in all, this recognition and cytokine release idea is going to occur just like we stated before in the helper T cell flowchart. All of that is done because this is going to allow the helper T cell, upon recognition of the B cell's antigen that's being presented, activates that B cell. Now, when you have activation of a B cell, there's two things that can happen. You can, you're going to create effector cells. Effector cells are always created, um, but there's two sort of ways you can create effector cells, two sort of routes. If you are activating a B cell, one of the first things you're going to be doing when you're creating an effector cell is creating thousands of plasma B cells. These B cells are going to be clonally selected to become thousands of plasma B cells because these are the effector cells. These are the actual cells that immediately take effect and are going to immediately start producing and secreting a soluble form of their B cell receptor known as an antibody. Produce and secrete a soluble form of a B cell receptor, an immunoglobulin known as an antibody. 
These antibodies are coming in the form of IgG, IgA, IgM, IgE, and IgD. So five classes of B cells means five classes of antibodies possibly secreted. Only when activation of a B cell happens, that's when we get secretion. When a B cell goes from an inactive B cell into a plasma effector B cell. In addition, activation of a B cell will create not only some effector cells, but also some memory B cells, so that next time you have the same antigen infection, let's say, you can easily and quickly promote a secondary immune response that will be more prolonged, more successful, and just overall much better at defeating that antigen, that pathogen, whatever it may be. So that's our B-cell activation. To take a look at figure 43.18 to understand that. Now I think it's important to recognize how this is going to work. Because remember, B-cells, we stated, don't actively go out and kill things, right? They just secrete antibodies. So it's worth understanding how an antibody functions. Let's take a look. AB function. For antibody function, this is shown on figure 43.19. Antibodies have a variety of functions and capable ways of disrupting or at least messing with or really making sure that a pathogen does not succeed within the body. But one thing we have to mention is the following. Antibodies don't actually kill a pathogen directly. So this is something to keep in mind. Because what they really are going to do, instead of killing the pathogen directly, the only thing that really kills a pathogen directly if within adaptive immunity is a cytotoxic T cell because it kills the cell. But this antibody is instead going to cause the following. It instead will bind to antigen. Okay, It will bind to a specific part of the pathogen that it's very good at binding to. And will do one of two things. It will either cause some sort of interference, it'll interfere with the pathogen's activity, whatever that activity may be. Maybe that activity is binding to a host cell receptor and infecting the host cell um, after binding. It may cause a problem with the binding that a pathogen is doing to host cells. Or, and or, we could state actually, and or, it may mark the pathogen for inactivation. Mark pathogen, cause the pathogen to have this uh, antibody sort of uh, signal on them. These antibodies will come onto the pathogen and actually stick onto it for an inactivation, which basically means the destruction. So inactivation or marking of a pathogen means it will eventually be uh, eaten or destroyed, destruction, let me make sure I spell this right, destruction by other immune cells. That's usually going to be, a lot of the innate immune cells will come in and show that direct connection between innate and adaptive immunity. Let's take a look a little bit more specifically because this is very general. I think it's a good way to understand this is to look at the actual mechanisms of antibody function. So there are going to be three main mechanisms of how antibodies do their job that exhibit either this interference or this marking capability. Again, these mechanisms are not going to directly destroy the pathogen, only either interfere with their activity, which can later be utilized in order to destruct them by other immune cells. Number one mechanism, this is known not in any particular order. Antibodies are capable of doing all of these mechanisms. They're just like three different types we're covering. Uh, one mechanism that you can utilize is neutralization. So antibodies can neutralize pathogens. This basically means that an antibody, or lots of antibodies, binds all around a virus. It's usually a virus that gets neutralized. All around a virus surface, because a virus has, you know, a capsid that's covering the genetic material, and so that's capable of being bounded to by something. Antibody is what's going to bind all over the virus surface, and if you bind all over the virus surface, maybe you bind all over the virus envelope, that basically means that the virus itself is no longer able to enter the host cell. Why is that? Remember, a virus has host cell, has receptors, right? And there can be a lock and key fit with a host cell receptor that may cause a virus to easily enter that entry portion of a virus's replication cycle. If you, as an antibody, stick yourself on the virus surface, you're basically sticking yourself all around the virus's uh, cellular receptors 
making it impossible for the virus to ever connect to a host cell properly. This is the idea of interfering with pathogen activity. Therefore, neutralization is a way that antibodies function successfully to cause problems with pathogen infectivity and capability. In addition to neutralization, we also see uh, antibodies function in another process known as opsonization. Okay? Opsonization. This is when an antibody binds all around, usually this time it's a bacteria, binds all around a bacteria surface. Okay, so usually viruses will be neutralized, whereas bacteria will be opsonized. Now, when it binds all around a bacteria surface, this basically causes or tells the phagocytic cells that are floating around within the blood as well, those white blood cells that are good at phagocytosis, it promotes them to do their job. It promotes phagocytosis. That just means the consumption of something and then the breakdown eventually inside via those hydrolytic enzymes usually. It promotes phagocytosis via macrophages. Macrophages are usually actually abbreviated uh, like this, M with an O and a slash through it. That's a macrophage abbreviation or neutrophils. Neutrophils are also phagocytic cells that can take up a bacteria, let's say, um, because an antibody, these antibodies basically in absinization act as like flags. And if you flag a bacteria surface all around it, it makes it very obvious for our own macrophages and neutrophils to notice, hey, this bacteria has all of these antibodies around it. We should do something about this. And they do. They phagocytose that bacteria and make sure that it gets killed within them. That's what their job is. This is the direct connection between innate and adaptive immunity, as you can see, because antibodies are a result of this. This is a very specific interaction of adaptive immunity. And then you get the innate reaction by macrophages and neutrophils called phagocytosis. Finally, last mechanism of antibody function is going to be another direct connection between innate and adaptive immunity. Antibodies may also activate something we briefly went over before when we talked about innate immunity known as the complement system. So the complement system contains over 30 proteins and in this system what we have is the following. An antibody, as you can probably notice, a theme here is antibody binds to pathogen, right? It binds to specifically an antigen on a foreign invader, okay? So that's the specificity that we see of an antigen-antibody binding event. And so that specific binding is going to cause the following. That initiates complement proteins which are these proteins that are found within your plasma, these are part of the plasma proteins, these complement proteins of innate immunity, if you remember, will then bind to the antibody antigen complex that just formed. So basically you have these flags, known as antibodies, bind to the antigen, it creates an antigen antibody complex. That alerts complement proteins to say, oh, this is kind of weird, I'm going to come and bind to that. So now we have another binding event. So once we have this double binding occur, this produces eventually through a series of many, many complicated steps. Um, we're just going to state that at the end of it, it produces a membrane attack complex. And here comes another one of my favorite abbreviations in immunology. It creates a MAC, M-A-C, not the computer, but a membrane attack complex. Membrane attack complex, what do you think is going to do? What's the number one way to kill something in immunology or in defensive pathogens? To destroy its membrane, to disrupt its membrane. This is exactly what a MAC complex does because it creates pores in the foreign cell's membrane. And this is good because this is a foreign invading cell. And so we want to kill it. How do we kill it? We create a MAC complex that's going to create pores in the foreign cell membrane. And guess what? that foreign cell is going to die. That's the death of invader. Okay, that's the death of the invader. Overall, that covers now our look at the idea of adaptive immunity. Take a look at figure 43.20. This is a very, very powerful, very nice summative figure that shows you an overview of everything we've covered with adaptive immunity, both cell-mediated, humoral, and the idea of activation by helper T-cells.